Hello, I am Andrea Anderson, and this is Queens of the Minds, Chapter 7, Part 1. In Berlin, 1843, in a cyclone of cigarette smoke and sexuality, Tsar Nikolai I of Russia and King Frederick William the Fourth were indulging in a private dance from the seductive Spanish dancer and burlesque performer Dona Lola Montez. Lola Montez enchanted or appalled everyone she met. While Montez was there in Prussia, Prince Albrecht, the king's brother, soon took the showgirl as his lover for a wild affair. Yet, like her kind, Dona Lola Montez was more than normally vain, selfish, ruthless, and immoral, and the seductress had eventually tired of the prince's company. One afternoon, she greatly embarrassed him publicly during a royal picnic. Humiliated, in front of the entire court, he demanded that she leave his realm. That's not such a long trip, she said with sass as she turned dramatically towards her carriage and away she went to Russia. Montez believed it was her destiny to be royalty. She wanted a castle. While in Russia, she was courted by one of the great magnates of St. Petersburg, Prince Skulowski. Lola failed to secure her royal marriage with the Russian prince and then headed to France. In Paris, Lola Montez began a relationship with the former Hussar Francis Lee. Lola's jealous tendencies were less than to be desired, and she ended up running him off with a pistol in a rage. Queens of the Minds features the authentic stories of gold rush women who blossomed from the camouflaged, twisted roots of California. These are true stories with some of my own fabrication of just descriptive details. It is recommended that you start this series from the first episode. In this episode of Queens of the Minds, we will meet a theater and burlesque sensation with a secret past, who will reveal herself as California's 19th century Queen of Temptation. The preceding program features stories that contain adult content, including violence, which may be disturbing to some listeners or secondhand listeners. So, discretion is advised. Lola spent the following year in Paris, frequenting the high society saloons with the most fashionable bohemians of the day. There was something provoking and voluptuous about her. The purity of the dancer's white skin, her mouth like a budding pomegranate, blue eyes that were tameless and wild, wavy bronze hair with dark shadows, like the tendrils of the woodbine it curled wildly back from her face. Montez led the most extravagant lifestyle, and it was financed by the collection of wealthy men she had seduced. In that year, she had become the mistress of the author responsible for the Count of Monte Cristo and the Three Musketeers, Alexander Dumas as well as the famous Hungarian composer Franz Liszt. The composer felt deeply in love with her, so much so that he dedicated a sonata, a long piece of classical music, to their love. She ended the year by marrying the part owner of the French newspaper La Presse, Charles Alexander. Months after the wedding, during a night of drunken gambling, her new husband offended a man and was killed in a duel. 
Lord Mumsbury, the elderly and proper Englishman had taken pity on Lola Montez after her husband's death. And Montez, as usual, took advantage of the kindness of her admirers. Lord Mumsbury hosted a benefit concert for Lola, where she made connections there that would eventually lead her to an engagement at Her Majesty's Theatre in London and funded her further travels. After the performance at Her Majesty's Theatre in London, Lola made her way back to Prussia. The following year, she found herself performing for the aging King Ludwig I of Bavaria. After she performed a private burlesque performance for him, the king was intrigued. The robed man pointed inquiringly toward her well-formed bosom and asked the woman, Nature or art? Lola responded by cutting open the front of her dress, exposing nature's endowment. The king instantly fell in love with Lola Montez. He spoiled her rotten and made her dream a reality when he gave the showgirl her own castle with a pension. The king named her the Countess Marie von Lansfeld, but he personally called her Lolita. As Countess Marie von Lansfeld, Lola Montez was able to win support from the radical university students in Bavaria. However, the Bavarian aristocracy and even the middle class had refused to acknowledge her as countess. One general was even said to have declared, I've never seen such a demon. She said I would see what a spirited woman could accomplish when she set all the levers of intrigue into motion. During her time in Bavaria, entire ministries had risen and fallen at the beautiful seductress's doing. Thousands gathered and rioted the streets on February 7th, 1848, demanding the expulsion of Lola Montez. The crowd echoed with the chanting, down with the whore. The king gave in to his people and his Lolita had vanished to Switzerland and then to London. In a stagecoach in London, George Trafford Heald, her newest husband, had bailed Lola out after an arrest. Heald put his hand on his wife's knee in a weak attempt to comfort her. Lola hastily pulled it away, turning her body to the carriage window, gazing at the scenery as they were approaching Madrid. He had by now given up on the attempt to console the stubborn woman during the last hours of their journey. He was only a British cavalry officer, but he had attracted the woman when he received a very large inheritance. Heald was 20 years old, to her 27 years. The age difference, as well as Lola's notoriety, scandalized his wealthy family. The life of royalty and great political influence was now three years behind her, and it was taking some getting used to. Are you enjoying the podcast? Please make sure to rate, review, and subscribe wherever you are listening. It is so important. If you would like to donate to the continuation of the podcast, please check out the donate button on queensoftheminds.com. Okay, back to the story. A decade before Heald and Montez were in that carriage rolling into Madrid, on the same street, the young Irish Eliza Rosanna was ready to start fresh, and the culture there in Spain was new and exotic to her. Her father's regiment had been posted in India as a toddler, and he died of cholera when she was three, and her mother was only 17. Her mother then married the Major John Craigie, who was the general of the British Army in India. 
they sent Eliza to a boarding school in England. And when Eliza was 16 years old, she received word that she was to return to India. Her mother and stepfather had arranged for her to marry a wealthy 64-year-old judge. On the passage to India, Eliza met a handsome 30-year-old Irish lieutenant returning home on sick leave. His name was Thomas James. She nursed Thomas James back to health in his cabin during the voyage. And when they returned to India, the two of them did not stay there long. And to avoid the arranged marriage, Eliza and Lieutenant Thomas James eloped and set off for Ireland. In Ireland, she soon found out that her new husband was a violent man, and their scandalous marriage was ultimately unhappy. When James needed to rejoin his regiment in 1839, the couple returned, and her beauty made her the new toast of British India, a title that was previously only held by her mother. While living in India, James strayed with the wife of another captain. Eliza saw it as an easy way out. She decided to leave him and return to Britain. As the ship left the dock, a dashing army officer caught her eye. George Lennox, the grandson of the Duke of Richmond. Surrounded by peeping eyes, their affair blossomed and the couple perhaps enjoyed putting on a show. The door of Lennox's cabin had swung open rather too often, revealing him lacing up Eliza's corset or him sitting on the bed watching her rolling up her stockings. The captain was so infuriated that he banned Eliza from George's table. When they arrived in London, Lennox set Eliza up as his mistress and introduced her to several influential men. The news of her affair eventually made its way back to Thomas James, and he sued her for divorce. Eliza lost everything in the separation, even though it was James who had strayed first. The terms of the divorce prohibited neither party to remarry, as long as they were both alive. The affair with Lennox did not last long, and he soon abandoned Eliza and she was left with no means of support. She now faced the dilemma that many fallen women in the era faced, virtually unemployable as a governess or a lady's companion. So there Eliza Rosanna stood on the dusty street in Madrid, looking up and down in either direction, and then back into the window of the establishment where she was to begin studying dance that day. Mobs of men and horses pulling carts were barely dodging the brave 19-year-old girl. That was then and this is now, she said out loud. Snubbing a cigar in the dirt, she stood up tall and walked in as if she owned the damn place. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, Columbia Mercantile, 1855. At first glance, it would appear a living museum until you look closer. In the clever Gold Rush era aesthetic, you will find a treasure trove of gold standard products for your modern life. Now more than ever, locals are discovering the amazing reimagined real working Gold Rush era general store. And Teresa, the owner, has been working non-stop stocking the store with all the things you're looking for at a time like this, like masks, cleaning essentials, baking staples, toilet paper, hardware, gardening supplies, housewares, gifts, antiques, and original fine art by local artists. And of course, food, beer, and wine. You can support local businesses there, such as Diesel Family Ranch, Inner Sanctum Cellars, Indigene, Cover's Apple Ranch, and Gold Country Honey Farms. There are also gluten-free, vegan, and dairy-free options. The Columbia Mercantile 1855 is located in the Columbia State Historic Park, 11245 Jackson Street, near the St. Charles Saloon. 
This is a great place to go shop to keep our local economy moving. At a time like this, it is so important to shop local. Open daily. Her Majesty's Theatre, June 3rd, 1843, Special Attraction. Mr. Benjamin Lumley begs to announce that between the acts of the opera, Donna Lola Montez will have the honor to make her first appearance in England in an original Spanish dance. Mr. Benjamin Lumley sat with Lola in his office at Her Majesty's Theatre in London. If you make a hit, he said, you shall have a contract for the rest of the season. It all depends on yourself. Lola smiled and nodded to the man. She wanted nothing better. As she left the managerial office, she felt as if she was treading on air. She stood in the wings in a black satin bodice and flounced pink silk skirt, waiting for her cue. Lumley passed her one last time, giving her a nod of encouragement. Capital, he said, rubbing his whiskers. Most attractive. You'll be a big success, my dear. The conductor lifted his baton, and she took in a deep breath. Everything had led up to this moment. The heavy curtains slowly were drawn aside, and her heart began to race with excitement. Under a crossfire of opera glasses, Lola bounded onto the stage and executed her initial pirouette. Her slender waist swayed to the music as she swept round the stage. Her graceful head and neck bent with it like a flower that bends with the impulse given to its stem by the fitful temper of the wind. There was a sudden hush at the finish of the number. She stepped up to the footlights and awaited the verdict. All was well. A storm of applause filled the air. Past the footlights, she could see Lumley from his place in the wings, beaming with approval. His enterprise would be greatly rewarded with the debutante success. There was no doubt about it. Lola thought to the moment where she would sign her contract with him and Her Majesty's Theatre. Then, breaking her daydream, an ominous hiss suddenly split the air. It was coming from the occupants of a stage box. The audience gasped in astonishment. Egad! That's not Lola Montez at all! It's Eliza Rosanna James, an Irish girl who had committed adultery against Lieutenant Thomas James and vanished. Ladies and gentlemen, we're being properly swindled! Eliza, unable to remarry under her own name, had reinvented herself as a Spanish aristocrat's daughter. Donna Lola Montez, well, Eliza Rosanna, rushed behind the curtain in tears. The audience in an uproar. Lola fled to Prussia, where she then bore all to King Ludwig I and became a Bavarian countess. I am Andrea Anderson. Thank you for taking the time to listen today. Let's meet again next time as we continue the story of Lola Montez, theater and burlesque sensation with a secret past, as she makes her way to California on Queens of the Mines. Queens of the Mines was written, produced, and narrated by me, Andrea Anderson. Male narration was done by my fiancé, Slim Cessna. And the theme song in San Francisco Bay is by his band, DBUK. You can find the links to their music and merchandise, as well as all of our links to social media, research, and donation links at queensofthemines.com.